Greetings to all of you, my dear sisters and brothers, and my dear friends. A warm welcome to all of you from your pastor, Yeti. In our new chapter, we're going to speak about ask, seek, and knock. And if by prayer, incessant, I could hope to change the will of him who all things can, I would not cease to worry him with my assiduous cries. Jesus' story about village neighbors must have provoked smiles and chuckles in his first century audience. A man opens his door to an unexpected guest late one night. Not uncommon in a desert climate that encouraged travels after sunset. Only to find his pantry bare. In a region renowned for hospitality, no decent person would turn away a weary traveler or put him to bed without nourishment. So... The host strikes out to a friend's house to ask for bread. Kenneth Bailey, a Presbyterian missionary who lived in Lebanon 40 years, illuminates some of the culture nuances behind the story. Palestines use bread as Westerners use silverware. They break off bite-sized pieces, dip into a common dish, of meat and vegetables, and eat the entire sop. The man with empty cupboards was likely asking his friend for a main course as well as loaves of bread. And even that was typical. Villagers frequently borrowed from each other in hospitality emergencies, and Bailey recalls one instance. While living in primitive Middle East villages, we discovered to our amazement that this custom of rounding up from the neighbors something adequate from the guest extended even to us when we were the guests. We would accept an invitation to a meal clear across the village and arrive to eat from our own dishes, which the villagers had borrowed quietly from our cook. In Jesus' story, Toth The neighbor stubbornly refuses to request, and see Luke 11 for that, he has already gone to bed, stretched out with his family on a mat in the one-room house, and besides, the door is bolted shut. Don't bother me, he calls to his neighbor outside. I can't get up and give you anything. A Middle Eastern audience would have laughed out loud at this lame excuse. Can you imagine such a neighbor? And Jesus was asking, certainly not. No one in my village would act so readily. If he did, the entire village would know about it by morning. And then Jesus delivers the punchline, I tell you, though he will not get up and give him the bread because he is his friend, Yet because of the man's boldness, his persistence, his shamelessness, I will get up and give him as much as he needs. The application to prayer follows immediately. So I say to you, and and ask, and it will be given to you, and seek, and you will find, knock, and the door will be open to you. Luke positions the story right after Jesus' teaching on the Lord's Prayer, drawing a sharp contrast between the reluctant neighbor and God the Father. If a Frankie neighbor who had turned in for the night, who wishes more than anything you would go away, who does his best to ignore you, if such a neighbor eventually rouses to give what you want, how much more? Will God respond to you bold persistence in prayer? And after all, what 
early father would sneak a snake under his son's pillow when he's asked for a fish, or drop a scorpion on his daughter's breakfast plate instead of an egg. The Lord's Prayer often reduced to a mumbled ritual. An incantation takes on new light in this story abutting. Abutting it. We should pray like a salesman with his foot wedged in the door opening, like a wrestler who has his opponent in a headlock and won't let go. The God who watches over you will not slumber, promises a psalm of comfort. And even so, sometimes when we pray, it feels as if God has indeed nodded off. Raise your voice, Jesus' story implies. Strive on like the shameless neighbor in the middle of the night. Keep pounding the door. Battering the gates. A few chapters later, Luke records another charming story, this time furthering a nagging widow as the unlikely heroine. Some of Jesus' parable left his disciples scratching their heads, but this one came with an unmistakable point to show them that they should always pray and not give up. The story takes the even riskier step of comparing God to a callous, corrupt judge who has to listen to the widow's loud grievance. Today, many cities have a free legal ad clinic to help poor and underserved clients, negotiating a confusion system of courts and dispositions. To illustrate the very different situation in Jesus' days, Kenneth Bailey cites a scene witnessed by a Western traveler in the 19th century Iraq. On a slightly raised dais, said the Qadi, our church had buried in cushions. Round him scattered various secretaries and other notables. The populace crowded into the rest of the hall, a dozen voices clamoring at once, and each claiming that his cause should be the first hurt. The more prudent Litigians joined not the fray, but held whispered communications with the secretaries passing bribes, euphemistically called fees, into the hands of one or other another. When the greed of the underlying was satisfied, one of them would whisper to the Kadi, who would promptly call such and such a case. It seemed to be ordinary taken for granted that judgment would go for the litigant who had bribed highest. But meantime, a poor woman on the skirts of the crowd perpetually interrupted the proceedings with loud cries for justice. She was sternly bidden to be silent and reproachfully thought that she came there every day. And so I will, she cried out, till the Kadi hears me. At length, at the end of a suit, the judge impatiently demanded, What does this woman want? Her story was soon told. Her only son had been taken from a soldier, and she was alone, and could not till her piece of ground. Yet the tax gatherer had, for, had forced her to pay the impost, from which, as a lonely widow, she could be exempt. The judge asked a few questions and said, let her be exempt. Thus, her perseverance was rewarded. Had she had money to fee a clerk, she might have been excused long before. And Jesus' story has fewer details on only two characters, but otherwise reflects a nearly identical setting. The judge finally yields to the plaintiff's pleas even though I don't fear God or care about man. Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice, so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. The phrase wear me out actually translated the boxer's term for a repeated blow under the eye. Once again, Jesus' 
presenting a parable of contrast in our prayers, we may sometimes feel like the widow, alone, powerless, a victim of unfairness, disregard, the least at last person in line. The truth, though, is the opposite. We have both an advocate and a direct line to a loving father who has nothing in common with the insensitive judge in the story. When God seems slow to respond, we may suspect a lack of concern. Jesus corrects the misconception, pointing beyond how we may feel to an assurance of God's mercy. If even this widow gets justice from a heartless judge, how much more will God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cries out to him day and night? And then, just as the audience settles back in comfortable reassurance, comes the sting in the tail. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? The disciples would have known exactly what Jesus meant, for he had just been talking about his eventual return, the second coming. Justice will surely reign one day. someone to talk to. Generations may pass before persistent prayer receives its answers. How many soldiers die before Tillich's own prayers for peace and justice in his homeland, Germany, were answered? How many Jews died praying for a future at a time when it seems the entire race was being incinerated? Filipinos prayed importunately for relief before People power brought down a corrupt regime. Millions languished in prison camps before the Iron Curtain fell to the ranks of peaceful protesters. How many Chinese Christians still suffer imprisonment and torture? While outside the prison walls, an unprecedented spiritual revival continues to gather steam. On a more personal level, how many abuse victims plead for healing and still wake up every day feeling wounded and ashamed? Addicts pray for deliverance and then rise each day to fly the same relentless battles. Parents give grief and prayer over children who seem determined to live self-destructively. Evil looms like a great iron gate. In Jesus' image and prayers hit against it like hammer strokes. Gates don't threaten or even advanced. Threaten or even advanced. They just stand there, awaiting to unswap. Our prayer may seem as tiny as the sound a hammer makes when it bounces off a sheet of metal. But we have Jesus' strong promise that the gate of hell will not prevail. It will surely fall, scattering into pieces like the Berlin Wall that once divided Germany, like the Iron Curtain that once divided Europe. Prayer does not change God, but it changes him who prays, said certain Kierkegaard. May have first made that remark, but I have seen it repeated in a dozen books and articles. For reasons discussed in the previous chapters, mainly the Bible's own testimony. God wants us to bring our request boldly and without reservation. By failing to do so, I will likely miss out on some delight surprises. When if the ten with leprosy 
by the side of the road had not shouted out to Jesus for healing, or if the Canaanite woman had shyly abandoned the request for her daughter. All too often, prayers uses God's presumed changelessness as an excuse not to pray. If God has already decided the future, why bother? That very fatalism, ironically, defeats the second half of the formula. For we do indeed change in the very process of storming heaven with our prayers. If I stop believing that God listens to my request, the empathic point of Jesus' two parables, I will likely stop praying, thus closing of God's primary mode of relationship with me. Persistent prayer keeps bringing God and me together with several important benefits. As I pour out my soul to God, I get it out of my chest, so to speak, unloading some of my burden to one who can handle it better, little by little. As I get to know God, I learn that God has nothing in common with an unjust judge or a stingy neighbor, though At times I may seem it may seem so what I learn from spending time with God that better equips me to discern what God wants to do on earth as well as my role in that plan. Prayer is not a monologue but a true dialogue in which both parties accommodated to the other. Although I bring my honest concerns to God, over time I may come away with an entirely different set of concerns. When Peter went on a roof to pray in Acts 10, he was mainly thinking about food. Little did he know that he would descend from the roof, convicted of racism and legalism. In persistent prayer, my own desires and plans gradually harmonizes with God's. Why should I spend an hour in prayer when I do nothing during that time but think about people I am angry with, people who I, who are angry with me, books I should read, and thousands of other silly things that happen so grab my mind for a moment? Henry Nowen posed that question in different forms, toying with different answers. Something Sometimes he fell back on the need for spiritual discipline, for being faithful even with no apparent reward. We must pray, not first of all, because it feels good or helps, but because God loves us and wants our intention. In the end, no one conclude that Sitting in the presence of God for one hour each morning, day after day, week after week, and month after month, in total confusion and with a myriad of distractions, radically changes my life. He learned humility and dependence, and after hours of persistent prayer with no obvious sign of fruitfulness, he realized that a small, gentle voice had indeed been speaking all the while. Prayer does not change God, but changes him who prays. Perhaps, sometimes, the eternal changes wrought through prayer make possible the answers that we have long been seeking. The change in God, if you will. Persistent prayer leads us into a special, in a new spiritual state for God to deal with. Perhaps that is why Abraham, Moses, Jacob, and the others found themselves wrestling so fiercely. The apparent struggle against God was developing in them the godlike qualities that God wanted along, all along. In prayer, we pre- present requests sometimes repeatedly, and then put ourselves in a state to receive to result. We pray for what God wants to give us, which may turn out to be good gifts, or it may be the Holy Spirit. From God's viewpoint, there is no better response to persistent prayer than the gift of the Holy Spirit, God's own self.
like Peter, we may pray for food and get a lesson in racism, racism I mean, like Paul, we may pray for healing and get humility. We may ask for relief from trials and instead get patience to bear them. We may pray for release from prison and instead get strength to redeem the time well there, asking, seeking, and knocking does have an effect on God, as Jesus insists, but it also has a lasting effect on the asker, seeker, knocker. For we are God's worksmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Paul wrote to Ephesians, workmanship conveys rather clumsily the meaning of the Greek word poemia, origin of the English word poem. We are God's work of art, Paul is saying. Of all people, Paul, with his history of beatings, prison, shipwreck, and riots, knew the trivial involved in the fleshening of that art and the role that prayer played. Prayer offers an opportunity for God to remodel us, to chisel marble like a sculpture, touch up colors like an artist, Added words like a writer. The word continues until death. Never perfected in this life. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for having the opportunity that You love us, that you walk with us, and that even in our deepest doubt and confusion, you not walk away. Maybe we just walk away from you because we cannot handle the situation. Lord, let us see the very deep importance of prayer. Prayer as you give an example in our Father. Let it be for us a new, vivid coming of life in prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Blessings to all of you, my dear ones. This is your Pastor Yari. Bye.